To share his views on the clean disruption of energy and transportation, please join me in welcoming Tony Siever. This is New York City, Fifth Avenue, 1900 Easter Parade. Can anyone see the car? There is one car in this picture. All right, we don't have all day. There. Okay, that's the one car in New York City, uh, at least the Easter Parade. This is 1913, same place, Fifth Avenue, New York. Where is the horse? Can anyone see the horse? This is a technology disruption. This is what it looks like. In 13 years, New York went from all horse to all car, okay? When a technology disruption happens, it can happen very, very quickly. Now, what is a disruption? It's essentially when a product or service, technology-based, um, transforms a market or disrupts it, destroys that market. That's a disruption. So that's what the car did to the horse. That's what the PC, the personal computer, did to the typewriter. And if you don't know what a typewriter is, then, yeah, point well made, right? Uh, and that's what the Apple iPod did to the Walkman. Um, let me fast forward to 1985. 1985. Um, the largest telecom company in the world, AT&T, the then largest company in the world, hired a management consulting company called McKinsey, and they asked them one question. In 15 years, in the year 2000, what is going to be the market for cell phones? So give me a 15-year forecast. So McKinsey, a very expensive bunch of smart kids, went off, did their work, came back, and they told them, in the year 2000, the market, the US market for cell phone will be less than a million. <laughs> less than a million subscribers. And of course, AT&T did not get into that market. It was too small for them. The actual number was 100 and nine million. They were off not by 100% or 120%, they were off by 120 times, okay? And this is some of the smartest kids from the smartest business schools in the world. Um, and by doing that, AT&T got disrupted. The landline business got disrupted, plus they missed out on one of the most important business opportunities, multi-trillion dollar business opportunities of the 21st century. Okay, so are we learning something here? Let's go to the year 2000. Kodak had a really good year in 2000. Revenues 14 billion, profits one and a half, 1.4 billion, they're sitting pretty, right? So 12 years later, Kodak filed for bankruptcy protection. They got disrupted. These are examples of disruptions. And it's usually the insiders, it's usually the experts who will dismiss market disruptions. It's usually the experts who will tell you, nah, why would anybody want to own a computer, right? Why, I mean, the horse will never be disrupted by the car industry, never gonna happen, or at least not in my lifetime. So, you know, I think about this every day. Why do smart people in smart organizations fail to anticipate let alone lead market disruptions. That's my work, okay? And so I think about three things that everyone who wants to anticipate disruptions uh, need, need, needs to know. 
The one is um, the, the concept itself of disruption, which has changed quite a bit since it was first introduced in just about two decades ago, um, which was disruption from below. And this is when a technology in the beginning is not good enough. When it's made with off-the-shelf products, it's not nearly as good as what the mainstream market is offering. But through constant improvements in the technology cost curve, this uh, going at a faster rate than what the mainstream market is offering. It may take decades, it may take years, but eventually they catch up and they disrupt the mainstream market. And an example of that is digital cameras. So digital cameras were improving by about 58, 59% year after year after year. And then one day, boom, it disrupted the industry. Uh, mobile phones, solar power. Um, this is the, 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 the publishing industry in the US, the, the print newspaper industry. And even when the web came out, their revenues were still going up. So of course, what did the experts say? There is no way, nobody's gonna read a newspaper online. Are you kidding me? It's ugly, it's, you know, uh, why would anyone bother doing that? And someone who actually, one of the entrepreneurs who created the ethernet said, the internet is going to collapse. It's going to catastrophically collapse next year. So again, it's the insiders who will dismiss these market opportunities. Um, and of course, here's what happened. Um, there's a certain company in Mountain View called um, Google which came up with a business model innovation, and boom, it disrupted the whole print newspaper industry. Um, now there is a new model of disruption, which is disruption from above. So that was a disruption from below. When you have a product that initially is not that good, but improves at a faster rate than uh, the mainstream market. Disruption from above. The electric vehicle, I'm gonna come back to this, but it's when you start with products that are superior to the mainstream market. Uh, they're, they're better in so many ways, but also they're more expensive. And because of that, they tend to grab a niche market, a small market, um, but the technology cost curve goes down at a faster rate than the mainstream market, and at some point, it comes and disrupts the market. It's just a matter of time. I'm gonna come back to this curve, but this is what a disruption from above looks like, and this is a technology cost curve. Um, the other thing that we need to think about when we think about disruption is the concept of exponential technologies. Um, so anyone who works in computers, anyone who uses computers, um, is taking advantage of Moore's Law. And Moore's Law essentially says that computing improves at about 41% every year. Now when you compound 41%, that means computer for the same dollar doubles performance essentially every two years. And if you double, and then double, and then double, what you get is that computing has improved by about a billion times since 1970. A billion times. So computers that used to be the size of this theater can be put into essentially you know, a little ring today, a billion times. Um, so this is the concept of exponential technologies. And uh, the web, uh, your iPhone, uh, internet, all of these uh, take advantage not just of Moore's law, but of other laws. Uh, network capacity, Butter's law of photonics, which has improved at 50% every nine months. Um, Kreider's law, data storage, which improves at a rate of 50% every 18 months. And all of these run in parallel. I mean, they build on one another, 
but they run in parallel. Uh, digital imaging, uh, you know, what disrupted Kodak is essentially 100% improvement every 18 months. Um, so all of these are exponential technologies, and when you put them together, then boom, you can, you can uh, disrupt a market. Today, we're looking at about a dozen, I'm looking at about a dozen key exponentially improving technologies that you see here. Uh, robotics, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, uh, mobile internet is still an exponentially improving set of technology. Sensors are improving hugely. And I'm gonna touch on some of these, not on all of the above. Um, but today, I'm gonna talk about four. Four sets of technologies that are exponentially uh, improving and are going to disrupt the existing transportation and energy worlds. But first, a question. Has anyone been to Barcelona lately? Barcelona? Wow, this is amazing. Amazing, what's in Barcelona? Parties, right? So which one, which city has a better nightlife? Auckland or, Bar or Barcelona? No brainer? Yeah, not even bother answering, right? Okay, let's say Barcelona, just to say that. Um, which city, Auckland, Barcelona, or Freiburg, Germany, has more sunlight? Anyone? Auckland, that's the right answer. That's the right answer. Auckland has more solar resources, basically for generating solar, than Barcelona. And that is shocking to a lot of people. You know, I've heard the mythology, oh, solar is not gonna happen here, we're, we're not a sunshiny country. Well, that's not true. Auckland is actually more sunshiny than um, Barcelona, which is pretty amazing. So, let me talk about the solar disruption. Since the year 1970, the cost of solar has improved exponentially at about 22%, That's, this is the learning curve. So essentially every time the solar capacity doubles, uh, the cost of solar goes down by 22%. So essentially, so this is a couple of weeks old, now it's at 60, 58 cents. Solar has gone down from $100 a watt to 58 cents today, okay? That's an exponential curve. And at the same time, which is something that you need to look at, you need to look at an exponentially improving technology, but also at a, at a, at a market that's also growing exponentially. The market for solar PV, the installed capacity has grown at a 43% compound annual growth rate. So it's essentially doubled every two years since the year 2000. Doubled every two years. Now, do the numbers. If you keep doubling every two years, what's gonna happen? This. By 2030, 100% of all the energy, not just the electricity, all the energy on Earth will come from solar. Of course, you have to ask yourself, is it going to keep growing at this rate? Okay, because if it does, we have a major disruption at work, right? So can solar continue growing at 40 plus percent? So let me move a little bit first to financial and business model innovation, which is as important, by the way, as technology innovation when uh, disrupting markets. In the US, what made solar grow at an exponential rate was a new concept, a new business model called zero money down solar finance. So third party finance. So the, the, the companies, the winning companies in solar in the US essentially go to your home or to your business and they say, I'm gonna own this, I'm gonna maintain this, I'm gonna finance this, zero money down, all you need to do is basically consume the energy that this generates. Zero money down. 
from the moment that that business model happened in Q1 of 2009, you can see the curve growing exponentially. And now 80% of the solar in the US is essentially that residential and commercial is sold with third party finance. So it was a business model innovation that created this fast growth and this um, disruptive path for solar in the US. Um, and a company like Solar City, or you know, US Solar City, um, they went public at $10 and now they're at like 60. So they've done pretty well uh, with that business model. They, they, they were the, the ones that pioneered that new business model. Um, and the cost of capital, now PV solar is so cheap that the cost of capital when you do third party finance is a much more important factor than the solar radiation is. So cost of capital has become more important than the cost of PV. That's because PV is so cheap. And we have a lot of innovations in terms of business model that have contributed to solar essentially growing at a clip of, in the US, 70, 80% per year over the last few years. And we're looking at 100% growth for the foreseeable future. Um, so financial innovation, business model innovation is every bit as important as technology innovation. And the cost of capital for solar has gone way down. I mean, just four or five years ago, you know, we, we used to pay credit card rates for installation of solar, and now we're paying four six percent. I mean, the market is, which is huge because cost of capital is so important. Now, solar or any technology does not work in a vacuum. So we need to compare it with other sources of energy. Now, since 1970, every single source of energy has gone up in price, every single one. I mean, they go up and down like a yo-yo, uh, but the trend is always up. That's because the marginal cost of energy is always more expensive as we move forward. So oil has gone up by 35 times, uh, natural gas by, by coal by six times, and so on and so forth. Nukes by 10 to 15 times. Um, while at the same time, solar has gone down. So when you compare the two, we're looking at improvements, relative improvements of in the thousands. So solar has improved by 2,400 times relative to oil since 1970. And this is oil at 50. So at 100, it's twice that, right? Um, in California, essentially, all 90% of solar customers start saving money on day one. On day one. So solar is already below what's called grid parity. So a solar installation will start, will generate at less cost than what the utilities offer today. Now, every electricity market is slightly different and we have 3,000 in the US and we have a couple here and so every electricity market is different. Um, but this chart is similar in every electricity market. You have electricity going up historically and solar going down. So at some point they, they meet and that's what's called solar grid parity. Now, according to Deutsche Bank, uh, solar will be below what the utilities are selling us in all 50 states in the US by 2016, that's next year. And it'll be below grid parity in 80% of global markets by 2017. 2017, we're not talking about 2030 yet, right? I mean, this is now, hundreds of markets around the world, solar is already cheaper than grid. Um, and the, the cost of solar keeps going down. Why? Because it's an exponential technology. And we know it's gonna go down at a 22% uh, learning rate because it's gone down since 1970, we know that. 
and the predictions are 25 cents a watt by 2020. That's the PV only. Total installed costs are gonna be about a dollar. That's according to Citibank. Um, and they're already there in Australia, actually, no subsidies. This is the actual cost of installed solar. So what happens when in 2020, the, the total installed cost of solar is about $1 or so. The improvement relative to all other sources of energy will be even higher. 6,000 relative to oil, 4,600 4, relative to nukes and so on, right? That's assuming that these sources of energy are not gonna keep going up in price, that they're gonna be stable, which is historically not been the case. They always go up in price historically. Um, so you think natural gas has a future? By 2020, solar will have improved by 6,800 times relative to natural gas. And natural gas, by the way, is at all time record low prices, at least in the US, and 2,700 times relative to coal. So in fact, because of this, the rate of growth this compound annual growth rate may actually accelerate from 43 to who knows what, right? Um, and essentially, we're below grid parity, solar is, in hundreds of markets. Now, I invented a new term, grid parity, God parity, God parity. So forget grid parity, we're already there. This is the point of no return. Now, before I tell you about that, I'll tell you that 51% of home builders in the US have announced that by next year, they will offer solar as an option. So essentially you build a new house, you check uh, double pane windows, check. A marble counter, check. Solar, check, right? It's just one check. So it goes into your mortgage. And what did I say about the cost of capital? Cost of capital is the most important factor in determining the cost of solar. So what happens when solar gets to a dollar and uh, you finance it with the mortgage? Here's what happens. In Auckland, New Zealand, solar on the rooftop of a house is gonna be six to eight cents per kilowatt hour. How much do you pay right now? Does anyone know how much you pay for electricity? Who said 28 cents? Yeah, 20 something, right? 23 cents, 28 cents. Solar on the rooftop is gonna be six to eight cents in Auckland by 2020. So essentially what this means is that the cost of solar on your rooftop is gonna be cheaper than the cost of transmission and distribution. So even if you generate you know, that hydro or that coal station, that central station at zero, it'll be more expensive than solar because you have to add that cost of transmission. Does that make sense? So at this point, central genera generating stations can't compete. They don't have a prayer. That's why I call it God parity, right? They don't have a prayer. Even if they generate at zero, which is not gonna happen, they don't have a prayer. Um, and even in Auckland, it's gonna happen by 2020. So in fact, because of this, the rate of growth of the solar market is going to accelerate even more in a lot of places. So it's quite possible, and this is the argument that I make in, in, in the book and clean disruption, that nearly or all, 100% of the world's energy will be uh, solar by 2030. Now, the other 100% will be wind, by the way, um, or at least a little bit. Um, and you know, what's happened, this, this is not just you know, a magical spreadsheet in Germany. The largest, um, in Germany, the largest um, utility um, was called E.ON, is called still. And what, what happened in Germany because of the high penetration of wind and solar, uh, power prices went actually down. Wholesale power prices in the day went down 
with the high penetration of solar, which is another mythology, solar is too expensive and whatnot, right? So as wholesale prices go down, what happens? Central generating stations basically make less revenue, boom, disruption. Um, so what happened uh, with Eon is a solar and wind penetration went up, their stock went down. Why? Because their revenues went down and their profits went down. And so they recently announced that they're actually splitting the company off and the Eon that they're keeping is the solar and wind trans distribution and customer solution. So essentially all the central generating stations, they're gonna spin off, even hydro. So this is not about renewables versus dirty energy. This is about technologies that are disruptive in energy. Now, another the, this disruption, another technology that I wanna talk about, energy storage. Now, the sunshine only happens in the day, usually, right? Um, and so, at some point you need to, if it's gonna be 100%, you need to store that. Now in the desert, um, there's a very cheap form of storage, but it's thermal storage. It's called molten salt energy storage. That's me, by the way. Um, and the first base load, meaning 24 seven solar power plant in the world, uh, was opened in Spain in 2011. It has 15 hours of energy storage. Molten salt is very cheap, um, but it requires desert type of heat uh, to generate. So we already have base load solar. Uh, molten salt, by the way, is environmentally safe. You could eat the stuff. In fact, I do. Uh, anyone who uses sensitive uh, toothpaste, you know that you're essentially eating potassium nitrate, which is one of the two elements. These are salt, this is like table salt, right? Um, and in Las Vegas, outside Las Vegas, they recently opened another one, uh, base load solar, 10 hours of storage. So next time you go to Las Vegas, you will know that Las Vegas at night is gonna be powered or is being powered by solar energy. Now, that doesn't work with PV or wind because it's thermal, not electricity storage. What about storage for PV and wind? Now, let's talk about lithium ion batteries. Anyone who owns a cell phone, anyone who owns a laptop computer carries around lithium ion batteries. And the computer industry has been using these for 20 years, essentially. So the cost has been going down by 14% per year for 15 years because of the exponential growth of uh, cell phones and iPads and so on and so forth. In 2010, two new industries got into the game. So before it was just the computing industry doing this, now three multi-trillion dollar industries are investing in lithium ion batteries the auto industry, the energy industry, and uh, the computer industry. Um, so what happens when you triple the investment, triple the demand, costs go down. You get breakthroughs, you get uh, 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 more, more, more demand, you get improvements in technology, you get improvements in processes. So over the last four years, the cost curve for electricity storage has actually been accelerating. So from 14% improvement per year, it, it has gone to 16%. Deutsche Bank says that over the next few years, it's gonna accelerate even more to 20 to 30%. Now, I'm not gonna use their number, I'm gonna use this number. Um, and of course, some of you know about Tesla's Gigafactory uh, that they're building in, in, in Nevada. This one single factory is going to double the world capacity for lithium ion batteries. Just this one factory is gonna double capacity. And just because of that, costs are gonna come down by at least 30%. Just because of the economies of scale 
uh, that this plant is going to produce. Now, after they announced this, other companies have announced their own gigafactories, BYD, LG Chem, Foxconn. I mean, so a whole bunch of people have said, what, your Tesla, you're building up gigafactory? Well, my gigafactory is bigger than your gigafactory, right? So, you know, so the investments are pouring in, which means, again, more breakthroughs, better processes, more competition, and so on. So this 30% may actually turn in, may actually turn into a bigger uh, savings. Um, but let's assume that it's only 16% improvement in the cost of lithium ion batteries. And by the way, I talk about lithium ion batteries. It's not the only technology for batteries that's improving at incredible rates, but I use it as an example of, of, of one that we can use for multiple industries. Um, so this is what we're looking at, at a 16% improvement rate. And we have two points uh, at which this becomes disruptive, when it gets to $200 per kilowatt hour, and then when it gets to $100 per kilowatt hour. And notice that it's gonna happen within the next 10 years. It's not, we're not gonna wait till 2070 to do that. Now, as I said before, business model innovation is every bit as important as technology innovation. So what is the business model innovation with energy storage? Um, so I said that solar as a service, third party finance, was what essentially kick-started the whole solar industry in the US. Um, so the uh, storage industry has essentially copied this business model, and now a few companies are offering storage as a service. So, and this is independent of solar, by the way. They would come into a store, the 7-Eleven or warehouse or countdown or whatever, and say, look, um, I can help you save money on energy, capacity demand or energy, um, with storage. I have better software to manage your consumption and usage of energy, and why don't we just save the money and split the money that you save, and I make half and you make the other half. Pretty interesting business model, right? The other business model is the one that exactly solar is using, which is, you know that you're gonna save money, I'm just gonna finance it, own it, lease it, you just pay me a monthly payment. Uh, so zero money down, 10 years to pay it off, and companies can save up to 10 to 50% just by having on-site storage. And by doing this, essentially this is disruptive to utilities because they lose pricing power. With storage, you can buy when it's low and use when it's high, essentially. Um, and Tesla has announced that they're gonna offer storage for homes and businesses because they're building this gigafactory. Solar City, our Solar City, and others are also going to basically include solar, I mean storage with solar in every single installation starting the year 2018. So solar is gonna come packaged with storage from here on end, right? Zero money down. Um, so let's look at the, again, at the, at the exponential improvement in the cost of storage. By 2020, we're gonna look at $200 per kilowatt hour. What's gonna happen, um, and by 2024, we're gonna look at $100 per kilowatt hour. Now, business model innovation. Let's finance it at the cost of the mortgage. So let's finance it at four or 5%. Um, and let's assume that you have enough storage at home to get off the grid. I'm not saying you will get off the grid, but you'll have one full day of electricity sitting in your basement. By 2020, if you finance it with the cost of capital of the mortgage, essentially, you'll be able to get off the grid for 36 bucks a month, lower than your cable bill. 
lower than your cable. You'll have enough storage to do that. I'm not saying you, most people will, most people won't, but the financial uh, incentive to do that will be pretty compelling. Um, so let me talk about another set of disruptive technologies, smart energy devices. Um, artificial intelligence, does anyone watch Jeopardy? Yeah, Jeopardy, come on, you can admit it. <laughs> Who was ACDC's drummer? No one? Okay, so IBM, IBM's Watson, um, their big computer for natural language, not for chess, for natural language. Um, beat two former winners of Jeopardy in 2011. And by doing that, they won a million dollars. DP, right? Um, not a big deal for IBM, it's a big PR move. Um, but it's already beating people in natural language, which is a big deal. Now, since 2011, here's what's happened. Watson, which used to be the size of a living room, now fits in three pizza boxes. So it's 10 times smaller, 90%, 10% uh, of the size, and it's 25 times smarter. In three years, Watson went from a living room to three pizza boxes and 25 times smarter, okay? Now, do that, that, that exponential cost curve of the performance, pretty soon you'll have it on your iPhone, okay? And 25 times smarter. And then after that, you'll have it on your Google Glasses or your iWatch. We're talking about three, six, seven years, okay? It may even be smarter than you. Um, sensors have improved at 1,000x rates over the last seven years. So sensors that used to be $100,000 are now 100 bucks. Sensors that used to be 1,000 bucks are now $1, and so on. 1,000 times in just seven years. This is a massive exponential improvement on many dimensions. So the market for sensors today is 1,000 times what it was just seven years ago. We went from 10 uh, million sensors per year to 10 billion sensors per year. At that rate, we're gonna go to 10 trillion sensors per year round about 2025. Now think about that number. 10 trillion sensors per year. Six billion people, seven billion people around the world. That's 1,300 sensors per person, per year. What are we gonna do with those sensors? Think about that, right? And they're becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Well, this is what we're gonna do with sensors. This is the, the Nest Learning thermostat. You just plug it in, it's 249 bucks, and you don't need to program it. It knows what you like, it knows what temperature you like, it knows when you're home. When you're not home, it shuts down the, 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 the air conditioner or, or the heat. Uh, when it learns at what time you usually come home, 6.30 p.m., 7 p.m., and 20 minutes before, it starts you know, getting the, the, the room ready, whether it's summer or winter. It learns to do that because of artificial intelligence and also because it has all these sensors proximity sensors, light sensors, humidity sensors, heat sensors, and so on. So that combination of artificial intelligence and sensors, this is what you can get. Smart energy devices that help you manage energy and manage everything. So the so-called programmable uh, thermostats, gone, disrupted. I mean, this industry has, was disrupted in, in a matter of a couple of years. And what is a next? a Nest uh, thermostat, but a whole bunch of sensors, right? Plus all of these other exponentially improving technologies. AI, mobile internet, big data, and so on and so forth. It saves up to 50% of energy without programming it, because it's smart, right? And because of the sensors. Um, and especially at peak prices summer prices or in the deep winter prices. 
when, when, when power prices are highest, that's when it saves the most. Um, and you know, there's a group of folks who came up with an air conditioner that's smart. So it doesn't need the thermostat. It does the same thing. It learns what you like. It learns when you're home. It learns the temperature you like. And boom, it programs itself. And this one is interesting. This is called Quirky because it was crowdsourced. So 300 people designed this smart air conditioner. Now we get into the, another disruptive thing, which is crowdsourcing and crowdfunding and, and, and all that good stuff, right? That's because sensors are cheap, the internet is cheap, crowdsourcing is cheap, people are open, boom, disruption, right? So let's put together these three elements, solar, storage, and artificial intelligence and sensors. Now you can have your own generation, your own storage, and your own energy management, right at home, or right in your building, or in your warehouse, okay? So essentially, it's a triple one, two, three punch of disruption. Self-generation, self-energy management, and self-storage, okay? Um, and what is happening because of all of this exponential improvement is that energy, is being pushed to the edges, meaning to the end user. So the, the, the model, uh, think of the way that publishing used to be, say, 20 years ago. Newspapers had big printers. They decided what information would be printed. They pushed it to us. We would pay money. Essentially, that was the way publishing worked for 400 years. And then the web came in. And essentially, anyone with a Twitter account or a Facebook account or a LinkedIn account became a publisher, right? So, so technology made publishing move to the edges, to the users. Energy is going in the same direction. Because of the exponential improvement in generation solar and storage and AI and sensors and so on, energy is being pushed to the edge, to the end user. Um, and these technologies are gonna keep improving exponentially for a while to come. Now, one more thing that I wanna talk about um, is the electric vehicle disruption. So, um, Tesla Model S was the car of the year in 2013, Motor Trend car of the year. Not the electric car of the year, the car of the year in the United States. Uh, Consumer Reports said this is the best car ever built, ever. Consumer Reports. The Tesla Model S in its category, in it, you know, the 80,000 plus luxury category, is already the best selling car in America. It's outselling Mercedes, it's outselling Audi, BMW, and all of these cars that built luxury brands over 100 years, okay? So, but who can afford an electric vehicle? Now, this is not my car. This is just a photo op, okay? I don't own a Tesla. I don't own any car, actually. Um, but first, let's ask, is the electric vehicle disruptive? because so it's expensive, so what? So is the Rolls Royce, so is the Porsche, right? Who cares? Is the electric vehicle disruptive? Let me give you a few reasons why. Number one, the electric motor is five times more energy efficient than the internal combustion engine, five times. So your car turns 17 to 21% of the energy in gasoline or diesel into kinetic energy, 17 to 21, that's it. An electric motor turns 90, 95% of the energy in the battery into uh, usable kinetic energy, five times. And there is nothing that Detroit can do about that. There's nothing that Tokyo can do about that. It's called the loss of thermodynamics, okay? So five times more energy efficient. Partly because of that, and the other part because electricity 
is cheaper than gasoline. You know, like moving electricity, moving electrons is far cheaper than moving a physical atom, gasoline, or gas, or coal, or whatever. EVs are 10 times cheaper to charge on a per mile basis than internal combustion engine vehicles, 10 times, okay? Your car, assuming you don't have an EV, by the way, which is an assumption I'm making, some of you might, has 2,000 moving parts. Moving parts, not parts, moving parts. And that's why cars break down so often. I mean, I'm surprised they don't break down more often. 2,000 moving parts, look at them. Um, an electric vehicle, a Tesla Model S, has 18 moving parts. 18, that's a 100x difference, which is why Tesla today offers infinite mile warranty, infinite. You can drive your car to the moon and back and they will still warranty the car. That's because these cars don't break down. Electric motors don't break down. And 18 moving parts, I mean, that's a 100x difference. This is disruptive because maintenance is a huge part of the uh, conventional car company supply chain, value chain. They make a lot of money out of that. So when you put these together and you know five other reasons that I mentioned in the book, here's what happens. And this is totally disruptive. So for 100 years, the car industry has taught us to buy cars on this basis. You want high performance, you want the Porsche, you have to pay high money. You have to pay the $100, $120,000. You want medium performance, then you pay medium money. You, you, you want little performance, then you pay little money. I mean, basically, the car industry has gone along this, along this uh, arrow for 100 years, okay? What the electric vehicle does is this. It moves the price performance curve to a point where you can get the Porsche performance for the medium money. And what do you think the market is going to do when you can buy a $40,000 car that has the performance of the Porsche or the $40,000 car that needs gasoline, you know, $4,000 of gasoline plus maintenance plus this and that, gone. Just like the Tesla is the number one selling in the luxury category when it gets down to 40, not just Tesla, any EV. I mean, in, 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 uh, in some countries, in Norway, 20% of all new cars are electric, 20% of all new cars are electric. So, you know, it's already entering the mainstream in some markets. So, okay, I'll convince you, I've convinced you, probably many of you, that uh, the EV is disruptive. How long is this disruption going to take? Meaning, when are we gonna get that famous $40,000 car? So, let's assume that you'll need to be a mainstream car 200 miles, right, 320 kilometers of range. Even, even if we don't need that much, let's assume that you need that much to be a mainstream car, right? I won't take you into the details, but here's what you get. To get a 200 mile electric vehicle today, at today's prices, you have to pay 70 grand. But if we do the cost curve, the 16% cost curve, we're gonna get a $40,000 electric vehicle by 2017, 2018. Meaning that the 40,000 category, gone. Because, you know, these cars are gonna have the performance of a Porsche 911 Carrera, right, for $40,000. By 2020, you will have a $31,000 electric vehicle with 200 mile range. Now, $31,000 is important because that's the cost of the average car in America, new car, okay? So, the average car in America, gone by 2020. 
The industry will be able to produce a $21,000 car by 2022. And why is that important? Because that's the cost of the low-end car in America, $22,000. And EVs are going to keep going down. So the disruption is not going to end 2022. Now, of course, we own our cars 10 years. So it's not like all the gasoline cars are going to be off the road by then. But essentially, all new cars are going to be electric. And you know, if you look at the announcements, Tesla has already announced that the, they have a $35,000 car, 2017. It's going to go 200 miles. And it's going to be 20% smaller than the Tesla Model S. $35,000. That's less than half. It's actually, a, yeah, it's actually about a half of their current Model S. By 2017, that's only two years away. But here's where it gets interesting. Foxconn, the company that makes your iPads and your iPhones, has announced that they're getting into the electric vehicle market. What? A computer company getting into the EV market? Does that make sense? Well, it totally makes sense because an EV only has 18 moving parts. An EV is a computer tablet on wheels. OK? Think of an electric vehicle as a computer tablet on wheels. That's what it is. When you plug in your EV at night, you don't just charge it. You're downloading software, just like your computer. That's what it is. And that's why we have co uh, computer companies getting into this business. I mean, Tesla is a computer company, essentially. It didn't come from Detroit. It's a computer company. But wait, there's more. Xiaomi, does anyone know Xiaomi? So Xiaomi is the third largest smartphone maker on Earth. There's Samsung, there's Apple, there's Xiaomi. Xiaomi is getting into the electric vehicle market. Does that make sense? Now it does because it's a computer tablet on wheels. So Xiaomi is getting into that market too. And a certain company in Cupertino called um, Apple um, leaked that they're also building a, an electric vehicle. Now, they haven't said that they'll get into that market, but they're building one. So it's computer companies that are doing this. So EVs are computer tablets on wheels. Um, so le let me give you my summary of electric vehicles. The mass migration, the tipping point of the mass migration from gasoline vehicles to electric will happen around 2017, 2018. That's when it all starts. Two, all new mass market vehicles will be electric by 2030, all of them. Essentially, gasoline vehicles, diesel vehicles will not be able to compete, period. Um, I mean, the numbers actually say before 2030, but let's assume there are bumps, no pun intended, uh, in the road. So in, essentially, internal combustion engine car manufacturers disrupted. Um, and by extension, if we don't need gasoline vehicles, what else is obsolete? Gasoline, diesel, oil is going to become obsolete by 2030 because 90% of oil is used in transportation and all of transportation will be electric. Now, here's another, in, but wait, there's more, right? There's always more. EVs are mobile power plants. Think about it. They have 50 kilowatt hours of storage. Now, the average American, and I hear the average New Zealander, consumes about 30 kilowatt hours per day of electricity. Now, if a 200 mile vehicle EV is what we need, that means we're going to have 1.6 days of electricity usage in the car. So we can go to work, charge at work, or we can go to you know, the supermarket and charge. We can go to the mall and charge and bring all that back home. 
So electricity is not just being pushed to the edges, it's also mobile now, just like computing. And we're gonna have, basically we're gonna be running around, driving around with one to two days of electricity in the car, okay? So we're gonna be able to charge the house with the car or the car, the, 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 the car with the house. Um, so electricity is becoming mobile now. Um, and the other thing that you can do with electric vehicles in the future is that they become an essential part of the infrastructure. So they become power plants. You can actually start making money by plugging them into the grid and balancing the grid with EVs and doing peaking power and demand response and all those things that the grid is very good at doing. So, so mobility is gonna become an essential part of, of um, uh, the grid and, and electric vehicles are gonna do that for us. So let me summarize this presentation. Um, 2015, we're here, essentially, we're here. You know, these markets, solar, storage, EVs, smart devices, are 1%. We're the, the, the one car in that picture. And you may lose sight of that one car. And because it's that 1% or 2%, you may think, ah, it's going to take a long time for this to happen. Okay? But we saw where this picture ended and how quickly it, it, it got disrupted, right? So the conclusion is that the clean disruption, so energy and transportation are being distributed. So from central to user-based, they're being digitized. So a lot of data is gonna go back and forth between all these smart devices. Dematerialized, meaning that we're not gonna need atom based sources of energy, coal, gas, oil, nukes, not atom-based, it's all gonna become electron, right? Uh, it's all gonna become photons. And demonetized. Demonetized because when we get rid of all of these sources of energy, then the biggest you know, revenue source of an $8 trillion industry, oil, gas, coal, gone. So just like we went from film camera to digital camera, we demonetized photography. Does that make sense? So by doing that, we're doing the same thing with energy and transportation. And they have become classic Silicon Valley technologies. They're moving at Moore's law. You know, cars are, EVs are essentially computers on wheels. Generation storage and intelligence are becoming mobile. They're pushing to the edges. And when you look at all of these uh, exponential cost curves and the business model innovations, then disruption is not just inevitable, it's imminent. We're going to see it. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen very soon. Um, and the skills that we need to run this new infrastructure of energy and transportation and the technologies and the organizations and the culture are different from the ones that we have used for 100 years to run the existing uh, infrastructure of energy and transportation. Um, solar, energy storage, electric vehicles, smart devices, enabled by a lot of these other technologies, artificial intelligence, uh, sensors, big data, mobility, and all that stuff. They're going to change everything, and that's going to happen over the next 5 to 15 years. And we'll see more changes over the next few years than we've seen, essentially, in a century. Um, and essentially, the companies and the countries that lead this disruption um, of $12 trillion a year uh, essentially are the ones that are going to lead the 21st century. Um, and as you can see, this is not in the future. This is happening, and this is happening right now. Thank you.